Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions. Eric, I will now like to turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Sheila. Uh, so welcome everyone to our webinar. My name is Eric Barnes. I am the Offer Marketing Manager for Motor Control Products for Schneider Electric. Um, today we're going to be talking about the next generation of motor control, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, and we're going to cover uh, how this, this new approach is going to change the game for uh, OEMs and for system integrators. So in our discussion today, we're going to cover some of the market trends and, and things that are happening in the marketplace and how that's uh, impacting uh, where machines are going to go, uh, how they're going to be used, uh, how customers will interact with them. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, motor control innovations, um, how things have de were, were designed in the past and, and what is available now uh, with this new offer. We're going to talk about how do we enable machine intelligence um, and, and how does that impact uh, the machine, how users, how maintenance technicians interact with the machine. We'll sum it up with some com uh, customer benefit, and then we're going to go over to a live demonstration. So let's talk about some of the market trends today in the marketplace. So one uh, uh, very obvious uh, you know, market trend that everybody, most everybody experiences is a prolifer proliferation of mobile devices. Uh, so on a consumer level, uh, a lot of us have these devices. Uh, we have apps on our, our, our phones, on our tablets, and we now use these uh, these platforms to now interact uh, on a commerce level, uh, to interact, communicate, uh, to check the status of our our home equipment. Um, you know, uh, it's really kind of changing how we as consumers interact uh, with things around us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the the fact that these devices are everywhere, um, they're very economical uh, to obtain. Um, that's going to start to impact you know, how, uh, you know, machine customers that buy machines or buy equipment, how they're going to want to interact with their equipment. They're going to want that ease of, of uh, you know, uh, convenience uh, of being able to see the status, to be able to, to, to check, um, you know, performance output, uh, to be able to make adjustments, to be able to get alarms and notifications. And this is really opening a whole new world for equipment designers to be able to add more value to their machines by enabling this capability. Another uh, key trend we're seeing in the marketplace is uh, the aging workforce. So we, we do have some very knowledgeable experts out there in the field. Uh, they're getting to retirement age. Uh, and so we have these experts in fields like, you know, maintenance, uh, maintenance technicians, operators. Uh, they know how the, uh, the machines work. They know how to operate them. They know all the nuances. They know how to make the machine uh, run optimally and keep it going. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for, for the, the industry in the U.S., uh, a lot of the, the, that workforce is retiring, uh, and there's just not enough people uh, in, in the wings ready to jump in and fill those roles, right? So what is that doing? It's creating a vacuum, right? So, um, you know, there's, there's a, a vacuum being created of, hey, I need to keep my machine running. I need to keep it maintained. Who's going to do that, right? Um, it could be more maintenance technicians, but likely what's going to happen is uh, some OEMs uh, are going to, and actually some already, stepping into that role. Uh, they, they build the machines. Uh, they're now starting to provide additional services to maintain the equipment, uh, which, which offers additional revenue opportunities after the machine sale. Uh, could be contractors, could be other places, other ways to do that. But this is, this is the trend that's happening, and manufacturers are starting to notice and, and uh, and, and trying to figure out solutions for this. Um, and then the third major trend, which we, we've all experienced is, uh, you know, in some form or fashion, uh, is related to the, the latest COVID pandemic. Um, it's forced us to do things uh, remotely. It's forced us to do things digitally. Um, and, you know, from a, from a business perspective, uh, you know, office type setting, it's much easier to, to execute. But from a manufacturer perspective, it's much more difficult, right? Uh, how connected is the equipment? Uh, can it be monitored remotely? Does the equipment give me uh, any type of alarms or warnings of, of things that need to take place, actions, uh, maintenance activities? 
you know, uh, those are all things that, you know, that ability in this environment is very, very valuable. It, it really minimizes the amount of downtime uh, and exposure in the workplace um, when there is pandemic conditions like this. So these are some things that are kind of shaping how, you know, uh, how the, the customers perceiving what they need moving forward and, and, and consequentially how uh, machine builders, how equipment manufacturers, how system integrators um, can now deliver additional values to meet these new needs. So let's talk about some motor control, uh, you know, innovation. Let's talk about kind of where get started. Where 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 are we today, right? Um, if you look at motor control, and I've got kind of a typical diagram here, um, you know, it really hasn't changed from a functional perspective since it was essentially created. Um, you know, we we have certain key elements that are there. We have a contactor that turns the motor on and off. We have a, you know, overload protection, uh, which, you know, if there's too much current uh, being drawn by the motor, uh, you know, for extended period of time, the overload protection will, will trip. Uh, and so that could be in the form of an overload relay. In this case, we're showing in the form of a, a manual motor controller ahead of the contactor. Um, but essentially, those functions really have stayed the same. The, the designs have, you know, they've gotten smaller, they've gotten more efficient, less coil consumption in the contactor things like that, uh, but functionally they haven't really, really changed, right? They really remain the same. Uh, and, you know, you think about the setup, right? The scheme of how we set this up. You know, if I've got, if I've got a logic controller in the system here, I've got IO that I need to be able to connect uh, to be able to get information back from the contactor, like what's my status, am I open or closed? I need to have uh, information back from the overload protection. Is it tripped state? Is it not in a trip state? Um, you know, uh, I need to, to operate usually through interposing relay to operate the coil so I don't uh, inadvertently create damage uh, on my IO for the, the PLC, which is expensive to replace. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the, the situation, the network we have set up, right? So, so it's kind of a, a lot of wires, right, <laughs> running around. Um, but another key thing that we've, we notice is in the, in the scenario where we have a, uh, let's say we have a, a conveyor system or a pump, and, and there's, there's a, a, an overload condition taking place. Uh, what tends to happen is nothing really changes from the, the, the control perspective until it gets to a tripping point, right? Then the overload protective device will trip, uh, and then that triggers the contactor to turn off the, the, the motor, the conveyor, the pump, whatever it is, stops. And then what happens, right? Uh, then, then your technician or your operator is trying to figure out, well, why did the conveyor stop? Why did the why did the, the, the equipment stop? So now they're they're okay. Let's let's shut things down. Let's open the panel up. Let's see what's going on. They trace. Okay. Oh, the, my overload protection device is in a trip state, so I have a trip. Now, why did it trip? Right? Was it a trip because it was an overload condition? It was too much load for the for the motor. Um, was it a phase imbalance condition? <clears throat> was there a jam somewhere? Jams will create an overload trip. Um, you know, there's a lot of scenarios that come, come out there and really don't know what's going on. So now we've got to do further investigative work, right? <clears throat> so we're in, when, in the current control structure, we're very much in a reactive state. We're, you know, something happens, they're like, okay, why did this happen, right? Now, now we're, we're digging into it, right? So there's a lot of opportunity here to, to make some, some value, to add, add some, change the game up to where we can develop a system that's more proactive and less reactive. And that's really what TESA's Island does. Uh, so TESA's Island, it does motor starting functions. It does overload protection functions, but it's really not just a motor starter. It's really a load management system. Um, so you're gonna be able to actively set and monitor <clears throat> for certain issues that your, your load, um, your, your devices downstream may have, right? You're gonna be able to get alarms about the devices themselves, like, for example, let's say the contactor is, is near, uh, you know, in the, at the end of its usable life. Once, you, once it gets to 90% of its usable life, it's going to give you an alarm, right? Um, so that's very convenient. Now I can plan on maintenance. Um, let's say the, the breaker device upstream trips. Um, the TSIS Island starter unit is going to give you an alarm saying, hey, your uh, upstream device is tripped. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great information that we now have visibility to. Um, Think about uh, energy usage, right? That's becoming more and more uh, of a, a concern for uh, you know users of equipment. Um, you know the, the the 
companies that have to pay these big utility bills, th those that want to, uh, to help with environmental causes, they want to know what's going on with their, their, their devices. Um, and so this gives the opportunity for us to monitor things like voltage. It gives the opportunity to monitor uh, you know, energy uh, and power consumption, not only for the whole island, but actually by individual motor loads. So there's a lot of visibility that this now brings, right? And this, th that data and that visibility now enables an equipment manufacturer to be able to do some things that are different, right? So let's talk about Tisa's Island. What, what is it? What does it consist of? Um, so it, it all starts with a bus coupler. Uh, this is kind of the brains of the operation, if you will. Um, it is going to house all of the configuration for everything connected to it, uh, you know, downstream to the, to the right of it. Um, it's going to uh, be the communication gateway. So it's gonna to communicate to all the devices downstream. It's gonna communicate upstream to your PLC. Uh, and it can work with a Schneider PLC, it can work with a third party PLC, uh, in, anything will work there, it's fine. Um, and uh, so we have that as kind of the brains of the operation. Uh, we have an optional voltage interface module, which uh, allows you to detect voltage. Uh, so you can monitor for voltage anomalies. Um, you also, once you have add this module, um, you'll be able to detect energy and power consumption. Um, and you only need one module for the whole island. Uh, no matter how many starters you have. We have optional IO modules. So there's a digital and an analog module and you can add as many modules as you as you like within a limit of the island. Um, and so you can fit that to your, your particular application. Uh, we have starters, uh, which that's doing your controlling, it's doing the, the protection, it's doing the monitoring. Uh, and we have uh, basically five sizes of five part numbers, if you will, up to 40 horsepower, uh, uh, 480 volt, or 80 amps continuous current. Um, so this it's very uh, uh, limited number of SKUs that cover a wide range. Um, then we have a, a seal starter uh, version, which is used in safety applications. Uh, we have some, some uh, potential you know, machine hazards, I mean, depending on what you're, what you're using, what you're doing. Um, this has a, uh, meets all the IEC safety standards. Uh, as well as uh, we include an interface for you to use as well. So the interface will allow you to talk to your safety PLC or safety relay to get that permission signal to then allow that starter to pull in. Um, and then we also have what's called a power interface module. Uh, so this is uh, similar to, to the starter, except it doesn't do the switching. It's only doing the monitoring. And you could use this in, in cases where maybe you wanna use a soft starter. So you put the soft starter downstream of this power interface module, you still can monitor um, the units uh, through this this unit here through the island, uh, and still be able to you know have the same types of controls. So, um, this is, these are the hardware components of Pieces Island. Um, it has a little bit different structure in how you wire it. So the the picture on the left here uh, shows um, you know the island uh, mounted on a DIN rail. And uh, in the control wiring, you remember before we had that diagram, how all those wires running around everywhere, um, well, all that kind of goes away. So, so now when you want to do your control wiring with Thesis Island, you're gonna mount this on DIN rail, and each, each island module has uh, a ribbon cable attached to it, uh, and then you're going to uh, mount all the devices on the DIN rail, and then you're gonna attach that ribbon cable to the adjacent device with a click. So click, 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 click. You make your communication cable connection to your PLC, and there's your control wiring. Um, so it's that simple, it's that easy. Uh, so that's really optimized there. Uh, in fact, we worked with a customer out in California that uh, um, did a, a very large dairy project. And by their own estimations, they estimate they reduced their, their build time for about, by about 30%, <laughs> uh, just because of the, the control wiring simplicity for that. So there's, there's some definite benefits there. Um, it's very common, they use common accessories with TSIS Island as far as reversing kits and mechanical analogs, things like that. Uh, but there's also, beyond the hardware side, there's also a digital side to TSIS Island. So in the bus coupler, there actually is a built-in uh, web server there so where you can, you can connect a device, maybe you wanna connect to your, your, your PC, uh, your laptop, let's say, uh, physically connect it to the, the service port that's there, or maybe you wanna connect a local uh, Wi-Fi router to that. Uh, so you can walk within range of that with a tablet, connect to that Wi-Fi router, you can log in to the, uh, to the bus coupler. Um, or you can uh, connect through other, other methods. You can send that uh, connection, send the information to the cloud where you can remotely monitor, you know, offsite, right? So um, 
But this gives you ability to be able to diagnose the, the island. It'll tell you, you know, if there's any particular issues, if there's any configuration problems, it'll tell you your trip histories. Um, you can see the settings, um, you know, you can set permission levels so that, you know, certain people when they log in will have certain access uh, or certain things they can view, certain things they can change. You can view the settings, you can make changes to the settings. Um, you know, think about the commissioning end. Let's say you're, you're, you've set up your island and you get on site and you realize that, that maybe the under voltage uh, or the undercurrent uh, protection setting is a little too, too sensitive. No problem. Just connect, you know, to the island um, and, and find the setting, make the adjustment real quick and save it and you're done, right? So, so it's very simple, very easy to, to commission and late point to find things in the field uh, without having to mess with the PLC program, which is very nice. So there's a, there's a whole digital aspect to this. Um, the way you size it, the way you, you select the products, the way you configure it. We have we have uh, configuration tools uh, for um, with, with Schneider PLCs. We have uh, infrastructure machine expert uh, that allow you to do that very easily. You can use the function blocks to make the programming much easier, much faster. Um, if you're using a third-party PLC, um, we have uh, Sobu software which you can connect to the island to set the configuration uh, there, and then you'll get your downloadable. Uh, files to then import into your, your PLC software. So um, very, very easy, very convenient, um, and, and kind of a new way of doing things. So let's talk about the different methodologies here, right? There's different, now that we, we can see more things with TSIS Island on the devices, on the power supply coming in, on the, the loads and their performances and monitoring for certain issues, we can now do things with that data, right? Uh, we can we can stay at the machine level, right? Um, obviously, you could you could send that information to a PLC, um, which then can communicate via HMI, communicate via um, you know uh, maybe pilot lights, however you want to do it, uh, to alert the operator or the maintenance technician that that some attention is needed, right, uh, or some some action needed. In some cases, you actually can actually manage the issue through. Uh, the PLC, like for example, if you have a pump application and it's detecting a jam, um, you may want to program your PLC when it gets the jam alarm to initiate a reverse, right? Uh, and, and try to clear it without having to either, even bother the maintenance technician, right, or the operator. Um, and, and only pull them in if, if the, maybe you've tried uh, you know, three times and it didn't work, right? So there's a lot of things you can do to, to actually make it easier for the customer. They may not even, you know, need to know there was an issue, uh, they could just get a report maybe says, hey, that we found this issue, we took care of it, right? That, that's, a, that's a very huge value add for, for equipment manufacturer or equipment, uh, you know, purchasers. Um, another way to do that is, is, you know, facility level, right? So um, maybe maybe some com some customers may not be comfortable with, with connecting their, their equipment to the, uh, to the cloud, um, you know, for, for security reasons, understandable. Um, but they do have facilities uh, where they have control rooms uh, and they have their own internal networks. You can entirely do it that way. You can you can connect your unit uh, so that you're able to, from a control room in your facility, be able to, to view the status, be able to get alarms that you set up uh, for the equipment uh, and, and, and be able to uh, monitor the, the equipment uh, from, a, from a site perspective. And then uh, if you do want to do more advanced things, we have more more capabilities, more remote uh, access. You could send information to the cloud. Um, we actually have a, an edge controller called the M262 that's got that capability built into it. Uh, and so um, you can cost effectively do that uh, and, and send information to the cloud. You can monitor through different apps and analytics. Um, you know, you can monitor, you connect it to your phone. Uh, we even have, uh, you know, cases where you can connect devices to a WhatsApp. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, application and, and be able to interact with uh, with the unit and get alarms and things like that. So there's there's a lot of ways to do this, um, and uh, there's you know, depending on what your customers are wanting to do, there are options. And as I mentioned before, you can use this with you know a Schneider PLC. You can use it with a third party PLC as well. So let's talk about enabling machine intelligence. But it's good to have data, right? But but data in of itself is, doesn't help us, right? Um, so you know, there's a lot of things in, in the market today that can give you running current, right? Um, that's not a new idea. Um, but where where OEMs have struggled, and, and equipment designers have struggled with with how do I apply that? Is is, is you know they're not they're what do I do with that, right? So so if I get the the motor 
uh, is running at 14 amps. Is that good? Is it bad? I don't know, <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's a little hard to kind of, uh, you know, kind of program that in your PLC to say, okay, well, if it gets to 15 amps, I want you to give me an alarm, right? Or if it gets to, to 11 amps, I want you to give me an alarm. It, it, you know, it's really kind of hard to kind of estimate what you need to do, and it's a lot of work on, on the engineering side to make that happen. Um, you know, uh, so Island's a little bit unique in that um, we not only give you the ability to see things like what is your running current, but you also have alarms. So you actually have the ability to uh, to set what's called an undercurrent alarm in this example here, um, where if the current dips to a certain, you know, percentage of its full load current, it will give you an alarm saying, hey, you've dipped to this point, it's, the undercurrent alarm's been, a trip, been, been, been uh, you know, is, is going off, right? Um, and that, that means things, that means something different depending on what you're doing with it. So, um, if you've got a, uh, you know, a filter blower system with, with, you know, with a filter applied to it, um, and you, you know, your filter gets dirty, what tends to happen is the current tends to drop. Um, if it's a little bit backwards, you think it would actually go higher, it actually drops, um, because there's less air to move, right? So we actually have the ability, and we actually worked with a major, um, HVAC manufacturer who actually tested this out and it proved it out and they were like, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> so we actually have the ability to set an undercurrent alarm, uh, you know, where a, you know, your typical filter may get, you know, to the dirty, dirty status where it needs to be replaced. Um, you can set that alarm, take that alarm and, and when that, and that alarm triggers, you, know, you can alert maintenance, you can alert, uh, maybe you have that sent back to your, your company, right? Uh, and, and you, uh, send them a uh, filter, or maybe you send out a service tag to go replace the filter, right? There's lots of ways to add revenue and add value once you know what's going on with the equipment. Um, if you're using a pump, right, uh, and you start to get a, a drop in current, um, that could be an indicator that you're running dry, right? And that's a bad thing. We want to make sure we stop that. Uh, there's a lot of vibration that occurs and you can create some damage. Uh, cavitation's an issue. So we can use that alarm to say, hey, okay, we got an issue here. Let's turn the pump off, right? So, so and we can alert somebody, um, hey, the, check your check your upstream supply. I'm not getting anything coming into the pump. Um, so that there's a, a use there. Maybe you're running a conveyor, right? Um, an undercurrent, depending on where you set it, can mean different things. It could mean potentially you've got a belt broken, or or maybe it's loose. Maybe it just means you could set it to where, hey, um, I'm not I don't have any load on this this uh, this uh, conveyor. Maybe I want to turn it off. Uh, or maybe I want to, uh, you know, use that information to communicate to the PLC to make sure that it's routing more more items down this particular conveyor that's not being utilized very well, right? There's all kinds of avenues that you can ways you can take this, right? But the reason this is important uh, and, and the value that it brings is that you know when you when you when you pick a motor for an application, you know, typically if you calculate you need to do five horsepower worth of work, um, you typically don't pick a five horsepower motor. You may pick maybe a seven and a half horsepower motor, right? Uh, and, and that gives you a little bit of leeway. Uh, so, so in case there are some other variables that come into play, we won't have nuisance tripping, right? Uh, but it also, um, studies have shown that if you run between 60 and 80 percent of your full load amp rating, that's kind of where you have the most energy optimization. So there's other benefits to doing that. But, um, you know, the full load current for a standard overload relay, you know, it's not going to trip until you get above 15 percent above the full load current rating, wherever you set it. Uh, and it has to stay there for a while before it actually trips. But with Island, we actually can see if, if current starts to go up, maybe it doesn't go all the way to the full load current level, but it's enough to, to at least create an alarm uh, based on your application. You can do that with an overcurrent alarm, um, you know, undercurrent. There's different, you know, we can monitor things like jam. We can monitor things like uh, stall and, and ground fault, things like that. So there's all kinds of cool things you can do once you'll be able to, to see uh, and set these alarms. So there's there's a lot of applications out there. This is actually just a, a brief snapshot, but you know we have all kinds of applications. You know, uh, pumping compressors, augers, conveyors, fans, and you know blowers, different things like that, where we're we're using a motor to do some some type of work, right? Um, and so uh, depending on what that work is, what that that load is, we can uh, look for certain types of issues, right? Um, and and you think about the different segments and different applications um, where these these types of you know, pumps, compressors, conveyors are used, um, it, it's, it's, it's all over the place, right? Um, there's also things we talked about as far as device alarms, you know, monitoring the power, um, you know, looking for motor-specific issues, right? Um, you know, those are all things that you can, you can manage as well. So there's a, there's a lot of applica, applica, application 
that you can use this for um, to really enhance the machine. So let's imagine we have a conveyor uh, line here. We've got multiple conveyors. Um, you know, it's, it's with, with all the shipping going on these days and people ordering things online, it's a very much an emerging uh, growing market and, and not likely to slow down <laughs> anytime soon. But let's say we have a, a distribution warehouse maybe and I've got these six lines I've, I've set up here. And this is just a, uh, a simulation. You can do things different. Um, you know, obviously you can do different things, you know, better things or, or not do these things. It depends on what you want to do with it. But, you know, let's say, uh, you know, line six, um, you know, we, we can have say, hey, here's just a status, right? Line six is off, it's not running. The other lines one through five, they are running, right? And there's my energy usage and here's their current runtime. Um, let's say in line three, there's a breaker trip, right? We can sense that with Island. Uh, we can sense there's no voltage on the line side of the starter terminals. And you can get a notification, you get that alarm. And so you can alert, you know, the operator, hey, you had a breaker trip on line three. Well, that's great. Now the, the operator knows there's an issue on line three, it's a breaker trip, you know, likely could be related to a short circuit type of an issue. So let's call maintenance, right? Um, and let's let's work around this. Let's let's focus on the problem and get it get it resolved. Um, let's say, you know, things are running and now, okay, line five, I've got a jam detected, right? So, um, you know, that we can shut the line down. However you want to program it, maybe you want to have it try to auto, auto fix the issue, trying to reverse it a couple times. Uh, but either way, the operator knows I've got an issue on line five, let's stop running current or running product down that line. Uh, let's use these other, the other lines that are available. Uh, or let's say maybe a line four, I've got an undercurrent, um, you know, alarm that's set up to let me know when I'm not use, using the line, right? Um, so, hey, line four is, is running, but there's nothing on it. There's no load. So um, let's let's shift things that way or let's turn it off, right? Um, another example, you know, line two, let's say the starter's been been operating for a while. It's 90% it's, uh, of its usable life. And you're going to get an alarm saying, hey, you need to replace the starter soon, right? That's great. All alert maintenance. They can get the part and, uh, and and replace it really quickly, and be up and running again. Well, let's say, hey, there's excess weight on line number one, right? Um, let's stop putting things on line one to give it a chance to to kind of uh, you know clear the weight and and be able to uh, uh, you know cool back down, right? Before we start loading it back up again, as opposed to the other way would be it just trips because there's you know, it's overloaded. You didn't know there was an issue to begin with, and you now you're reacting. Well, why, is, well, why is line one down, right? Um, so now you can be a little more proactive in how you manage these particular types of issues. Um, maybe another thing is you want to you want to monitor the runtime, right? And and you want to say, hey, uh, when we get to certain uh, milestone points, we need to do maintenance on on the conveyors and lubrication and and da 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 da. I mean, there's all kinds of different uh, things you can kind of put in depending on what type of system you're running. So this is just one idea, one simulation, um, and there's there's a myriad of opportunities, a myriad of, of problems that you can solve uh, based on what your customers are seeing. Um, I want to share with you a real quick uh, customer success story. Uh, so we have a, a customer out in California, system integrator that was working with a, a, a pasta manufacturing company, and they had this issue where as they're, as they're forming the pasta, it goes through these drying processes uh, that have to be you know, reasonably accurate um, to make sure the product is good. And these are these are enclosed contained systems. There's a lot of fans, there's a lot of conveyors. Uh, and uh, in fact, this line they're working on had over 80 units in it. So there was a lot of motors. Um, and one of the issues they have is that um, if the fan stops, it doesn't doesn't operate, starter pulled in, you know, the, the PLC thinks it's running, it's not running. So um, they don't know that because it's not visible, right? So the, the way they find out is that their product quality starts to deviate. I'm like, well, why why is the product you know not not uh, meeting our quality standards? Then they got to go to investigations. Oh man, like there's three fans here that aren't working, right? So um, with Island, you know that we can totally detect those things. Another issue they had was sometimes uh, material gets bound up, right? Uh, and if it does get bound up, it starts to accumulate and build up and build up, and then it starts overflowing, and now they've got this mess. <laughs> And so, uh, but they don't really know that there's a problem until later down the cycle when they're looking and saying, hey, there's nothing coming out. Um, there's a problem somewhere. So they shut the machine down. Then they got to go investigate. Oh, I found it. There's all this pasta everywhere. <laughs> so now they got to clean all this stuff up, right? So a lot of downtime, right? And so the, the, the pasta uh, company asked the system integrator, help us solve these problems, right? We, we don't want to be reacting like this. It's very huge, very, very inefficient. 
And so the system integrator, you know, said, hey, I've got these, 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 these needs here. And we said, hey, we've got a great product for you. It's Thesis Island. You can monitor things like, uh, you know, is, is there actual load on the fan uh, when you turn it on to verify it's operating? You can monitor things like what's what's the weight, um, you know, what's what's the current being moved on the on the conveyors? Do do we sense that there's something there? Um, and we can we can sort of look for things, right? So when we see that there's when that, the fans stop running, we can alert maintenance and have the next downtime they can plan to to, to repair that, right? Or if we we were seeing, hey, there's material bound here, I'm not getting any weight on these other parts of the the conveyors. Um, let's stop it right away, right? Let's stop the upstream, pour, piles up on us. Let's go get, uh, you know, operators and, and folks in there, get the material cleaned out quickly, and we can get back up and running, right? So the mess is much faster to clean up as opposed to reacting. So very, very neat uh, application here, um, and, and just one example uh, of how Island can be used uh, to change the game, to make things uh, work more efficiently um, for customers. So let's talk about some of the customer benefits real quick. Um, so imagine you're a machine manufacturer, equipment manufacturer, um, you know, what does this do for you, right? Well, it allows you to sell smarter equipment, right? Which adds value to your customers uh, and, and you either can drive, drive you know, additional revenues per machine or maybe you sell more machines, right? Uh, so there's a revenue element there on the machine level. But then there's also, because of the capability and intelligence, you have the ability to now uh, you know, offer additional services, monitoring services, maintenance services, because the machine's telling somebody, whether it's you or the operator, it's time to replace the filter, it's time to, to take this action. You know, those are all things you can use as triggers as additional revenue points for the equipment manufacturer. But let's let's imagine you're a system integrator and every job's a little bit unique, right? There's, because of the digital aspects of this and the way uh, we, we connect and communicate with the unit, um, you can design your systems faster um, using function blocks and things like that. You can install it faster with the ribbon cables, eliminating all those cables, like the wires that run around everywhere. And you can troubleshoot a lot faster um, when, when you're setting things up, or when you're, you're trying to solve a problem for a customer because of the visibility and what you can see what's going on. So Allen really changes the game for customers. Um, we have additional information for you. Um, so you, if you have your phone, you can use your phone, hold it up to the screen on the camera, and uh, it should pop up with a, uh, a link. So you can actually download these different places, different tools we have. Um, you know, there's this catalog, there's, there's a, a thesis island kind of overall landing web page. Um, there's a selection tool, which is, which is how you really select the product. You don't really use the catalog, you use the selection tool. And you go through and you tell us what it is. It's a four diverse motor, um, it's three horsepower, you know, and, and pretty soon you build your build material up pretty quickly, and, and, and now you can export that information, you can download it, you can get the, all the documentation related to it. Um, so a lot of good information here um, that you can, you can use to learn more about Tisa Island. So with that, we are going to turn it over to Jacob, and he is going to give us a uh, live demonstration. Thank you, Eric. Hi everybody, I'm Jacob Stendel. I'm with Crescent Electric and uh, today we're going to go over a Tesis Island demonstration. Uh, I'm going to begin here by sharing my screen and you guys should be able to see the uh, live view of my Tesis Island setup and login portal to access the OMT tool. So <clears throat> essentially here I have a bus coupler hooked up, a dig digital I.O. unit, a voltage interface and a starter. Uh, <clears throat> Eric covered a lot of the main points on it. Uh, there's, you know, you can have up to 20 modules on an island, in, plus the bus coupler and the voltage interface module. Um, this unit here is a basic one direction starter. Um, you know, there's options for reversing, two speed, conveyors, pumps, Y delta, and so on. So I'm going to begin by logging in here. Look on the bus coupler. Um, the top portal is my terminal port. That's how I'm going to access it here. And you can have user groups and rights assigned to what each operator or uh, manager or technician can see and control on the TSIS island here, which is important because sometimes you don't want them to be able to configure set points or alarms. You only want them to view it. So this is what you see when you log in here. Uh, I'm going to go to the island view first here. This is currently showing you the live um, island and all the available alarms that have uh, ran into and used on my demo unit here. So 
the tabs on the left are all your navigate your navigation tabs. This is how we interact with it. Click on, for example, the different modules. You can see what's currently going on: the power cycles, the contactor cycles, your max power, your runtime. So these are all really important feedback and information that you don't get with a traditional contactor system. How many times have you, maybe not you, but your customers have ran into a problem where, you know, they're trying to diagnose a machine and they can't figure out why it's tripping. You know, it might only happen once a day or, you know, it happens when it's a full moon and no one can figure out why, right? Well, this system gives you that feedback that you really need to diagnose a problem. And really that comes down to reducing your downtime. So I'm gonna hop into the avatar view here. And this is where you can see the available control for each individual module. Um, I'm going to force it on here to demonstrate a running sequence here and show you guys the different alarms and what we can do with it. So right now I have it running. I'm going to shift my camera back up. We're currently pulling half an amp, and I have that configured to be an undercurrent warning. So this doesn't trip the contactor, but this gives you an alarm to let you know that, hey, I might be freewheeling or a gearbox is, is disconnected, or a shaft is broken, or a belt is failing. You know, these are all some, you know, real situations that you run into that you'd never know with a traditional system. Now, what happens if I increase the load? I have this motor configured for a 0.9 full load amp, and now we're hovering about one. Well, now I'm getting an overcurrent alarm. Still doesn't trip, but it lets you know that, you know, you might be creeping up and there might be issues where your conveyors are overloaded, your boxes are binding up, you know, something's failing. But now you're running, and now you're really pulling too much power. You know, now we're hitting that 1.2 amp area, and I just tripped. Now I have an overcurrent trip. But I have it configured to try again. You know, this is an auto reset feature that you don't get with any other contactor system. You know, now the current's re leveling back out, and now we're going to approach the normal operating level. Now we're at 0.7 amps and all as well. So, you know, this is something that you don't get with any other contactor system, and I really like this feature because it's such a big deal with troubleshooting and reducing that downtime is you can actually see what's going on with the process. So, diagnostics would be if you run into any issues. Let's go into energy monitoring. So here's our instantaneous power monitoring. We have our active reactive power, our power factor. Now this is all great useful information to see what's going on with your load. They have built-in time of use, so you can configure the channels, and you can trend and graph your energy over time. This is just your total stack counter here. Something like this is a great way to monitor what's going on with everything here. So I want to go into diagnostics. Let's go into settings. I'm going to click on my avatar. And here's all the different protection modules, that protection settings you can configure on just the one starter. I have my FLA configured at 0.9. You can have your ground current. <clears throat> that's a great big deal if you have, you know, perhaps you're, you got a phase that's leaking out, you know, your bearings are failing, something's causing issues, you can set that here. Load protection is really where all, all that important adjustable set points for protection come into play here. You can configure the level, how long it takes before it trips, and then you can also tell it how often you the, rest, the restart counter. You, you can tell it that, yeah, you can have it restart for load, but if it's an electrical problem, don't try to restart. Just trip out. So, and these are all configurable. You know, when it comes to your process, maybe there's a time where you don't want it to trip in three seconds because you know that conveyor takes 10 seconds to get up to speed based on the load it hits. Well, you just set that to 10 seconds, and then you adjust, you set your percentage of the FLA of what you want it to report back. Here's that automatic reset that I discussed where you can have it configure. Thermal, re thermal reset is when you know your motor overheats. You can have it wait a specific time and then try to start again. Electrical, you only want to try to three. It's, it's configurable and you can give it the reset timer that you want. So then we can jump into predictive alarms that you can define each one. Where what kind of protection do you want? When it's a jam, then you can give it to an output or an input and then get feedback on what you want to do with that, handle that in your programming. So these are all important things that you don't get with a contactor setup and really has a great benefit to it. So let's go into counters. 
counters here can show you all the different alarms and how often it happens and look at all the available uh, forms of trips and alarms there are. You know, you get your phase imbalance, current reversal, stall, all these different options that you can disable and enable. Decide from there what you want to do with your process. There's a lot of options on how you want to configure your setup. It's, you know, completely configurable to how you see it. So whether it be fans, pumps, conveyors, they have you covered there. So all these functions are, this is the online <clears throat> monitoring tool, but a lot of this information is all available in those function blocks. You can drop in your machine expert program or whichever PLC you're talking to, whether it be Modbus, Ethernet IP, Profibus, and Profinet, it's all covered. With that, that covers the majority of my demo here. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over for closing notes to Louie. Thanks, Jacob. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. My name is Louis Scheider. I'm the director of the industrial business here at Crescent Electric. I'd like to talk to you about a promotion that we're running for our customers. We have a Try Before You Buy program. Uh, we have three kits that are available, a 5 horsepower, a 15 horsepower, and a 25 horsepower. Each kit will include digital I.O., 4N, 2 out, the voltage interface module, and the equivalent or the appropriate starter listed above. For information on how to acquire one of these, I'll contact your Crescent Electric account manager, okay, or you can contact our tech support center at either the number listed there below or tech support at crescentelectric.com. Uh, uh, next slide, Q&A. So we're going to open it up for questions. Uh, the way to uh, ask a question is in the Q&A area there. And uh, we'll monitor, it looks like we've got one here. Who would I contact if I wanted this exact presentation for a customer? Uh, go ahead and contact uh, myself. I have a copy of the, the presentation and I'll get that to you. Okay, we have another question here. I think I heard you say earlier on how many starters I could have, but uh, just to be clear, how many starters can be used on an island? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it, it does depend on um, the configuration. So that's why the selector tool is very helpful because let's say you have uh, all 40 horsepower motors, which consume more energy on the coil. Um, it actually will do the calculation for you, but on a typical system, you can do up to 22 modules. And that's a, so a starter is a module, a voltage interface module is a module, the IO, you know, digital IO, analog IO, those each are modules. So up, up to 22, but the tool will actually help you make sure you configure it correctly so you don't have any problems in the field. Eric, does the uh, uh, communication module count as a module? No, that's the first one. Uh, it does not count as one of the modules that, that uh, uh, as far as the limitation goes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Uh, what circuit protection can be used with Pieces Island? Eric? Yeah, good good question. It actually is kind of configured to where you can use, you have many options. So we have it to where you can use um, a one single breaker for the entire island using the group motor approach. It has, has excellent group motor ratings. Um, you can use it where you can put individual circuit protection ahead of each starter module, um, like you would with a typical breaker, you know, contact or overload arrangement. Um, if you use a, like a multi-nine mentor circuit breaker, that's a, that's a 10K solution. If you use a uh, higher rated breaker, um, you can get as high as 85 kA uh, on that solution. Um, you can use fuses uh, with it as well. And then you also can use um, our, our GV manual motor controllers with it as a group motor structure. So you'll have your circuit breaker upstream as your as kind of your, your, your main, if you will. Uh, and then you'll feed your, your GV devices, the TSIS uh, GV motor, manual motor controllers ahead of each starter. So there's different ways you can do it. That solution gets you 50 kA at 40 volts. Um, so if you have questions, let us know. We'll, we'll be glad to kind of look at your scenario and help you uh, figure out what options you have to fit your particular application need. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, does the Kesis Island have a short circuit uh, current rating? Yeah, it, it does, it does. So we, so we can do, um, you know, the standard default is 5KA. So if, if that's not an issue for you, you can, you can go right in with a 5KA and no issues there. Um, but um, the, con the starters, 
have um, up to 85 kA with a circuit breaker at 40 volt, which is really good. Um, they have uh, 100 kA with fuses, uh, either Class J or Class CC. Um, and uh, we also have a 50 kA uh, group motor uh, option with the GV, TSIS GV product and the starter. Uh, and that's a, a 50 k at 40 uh, a volt. So. Okay, super. Thank you. All right, now I'm not seeing any more questions. So I, I guess we'll move on to closing. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Eric and Jacob uh, for the presentation today. Nice job, fellows. And I'd like to thank everyone who took the time out of their busy schedules to attend our seminar webinar today. We appreciate that. Uh, again, don't forget to contact your account manager about our offer on the try before you buy with TSIS Island. We're taking the risk out of it with you. We'll also help you with your application and get it configured appropriately. Uh, if you have technical questions, again, text support at sesco.com or you can call that 800 number and uh, they can answer your technical questions. And if you're trying to find somebody locally to work with, we can get you to that person. So thanks again and everybody have a great day.